You out there guys, this is Dale of Lone Wombat Airsoft and today we're taking a look at the Tokyo Marie PS90 High Cycle AEG. Now if you've never seen one of my video reviews before, the way I always do it is I put some annotations up here and here. So if you can click on those, it'll skip ahead straight to the part of the video if you want to find out something specific about this gun. Now I've owned this for a good couple of months and I've put in a lot of hours skirmishing with it so I've really gotten to know the platform and most importantly I've allowed any potential flaws or mechanical issues to make themselves known before I review it. And so without any further ado we're just going to dive straight on into the review. The P90 is a PDW or personal defence weapon created by Belgian manufacturer FN Hestal. It was designed to fire the 57 by 28 mm round, a small but very high velocity bullet that's capable of piercing modern body armour. The short and barrel and compact design means that it was used for vehicle crews and special forces groups primarily. It was also designed to be extremely user friendly regardless of whether you're left or right handed. The main body has some very rounded edges which means that it's never going to catch on your spare gear or close environments. It's also completely ambidextrous, so much so that the spent shell casings would actually eject at the bottom of the gun. So regardless of whether you're left or right handed, you never had to worry about where the spent brass was going. Uh, the PS90 variant, which we see just here, was originally designed for the American civilian market. Um, the extended outer barrel was put in place to comply with local law enforcement where they put in a tax law trying to regulate short barreled rifles. Uh, also, it was shipped with a limited 30 round magazine, usually they hold 50 rounds, again to comply with tax laws. Now, luckily for us, however, the airsoft version by Tokyo Marie, this outer barrel can be completely removed, it doesn't affect performance whatsoever. The magazines hold 300 rounds, so capacity is not an issue, and it's also fully automatic. Now, I picked this gun up from firesupport.co.uk for about £315, and at the time of recording, they still have plenty of these guns in stock. So I'm going to drop a link in the description down below if you want to pick one up yourself. So what exactly do you get in the box once it actually turns up? Well, the first thing I want to point out with this box is it has an extremely large image of the gun on the front and several on the sides as well. So if you plan on transporting your gun to game sites in this, be careful where you show this box just in case the general members of the public, they might get the wrong idea if they see a box with a giant ass picture of a submachine gun on it. Now, inside the box itself, you're going to find your P90 held in place by this very low-profile Velcro strip just here. Also, it's quite stylish, I noticed, on the inside. It makes a good display case if ever you want to show it off. Um, inside the box, you're going to find a manual just here. Now, when you first open this, it can be a little bit intimidating by the sheer volume of Japanese characters in it. But when you look a bit closer, it is also written in very clear and easily understandable English. Uh, just give it a quick read. There is um, some good English printed in this, even though looking at all the Japanese characters might put you off a little bit. Uh, also, you get included a paper shooting target with your general warnings on it as well. And not one, but two packets of rubbishy token BBs. These are your standard, absolutely terrible ones. Never use these. Now, these ones that come with it as well, the second packet, they look a bit more high quality, but just to play it safe, I'd get some actual airsofting BBs and use those instead, instead of both of these packets. You also get a little unjamming rod at the bottom. So overall it's quite a nice presentation for a box and I've been using it to transport it to games as well. So fairly decent actually. They've uh, put a fair amount of extras in as well as your P90. So the first thing you're going to notice when you pick up the P90 is that it kind of feels a little bit like a toy. This is mainly due to the fact that the gun is almost exclusively plastic bodied as are most Tokyo Marui guns. But it's also very light as well, which can detract from the realism a little bit. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't feel like a high quality gun. It does, but some people have a thing about plastic body guns. And if you're one of those people, then perhaps this isn't something you'd like to feel that much. Now, it does shoulder quite nicely and you can fire it one handed because it's so light and all the firing mechanisms located at the back. That does make it very flickable and easy to use in close quarters environments. It's also handy if you're playing an objective game and you have an objective in one hand, you can still fire and shoot the P90 one-handed quite comfortably. Uh, one thing I've noticed though, especially with one-handed use, is that because the finish is quite slippery, you tend to find it twists out your grip a little bit when one-handed it, but that's just a minor niggle really. Uh, another thing with the finish as well, I've noticed it started to scratch in some bits around the side of it as it's been caught on bits of woodland, so it is quite easy to mark. Now, if you can get over the fact that it's plastic bodied, if you're not really bothered about that, then it does give a fairly good first impression, honestly, especially considering how light it is. But as I say, plastic body, not for everyone. 
So going over some of the features of the gun then, the first thing to note is that this outer barrel can be removed without affecting the performance of the gun in any way. You just simply twist it to remove it. Now, firstly, I think this thing is absolutely hideous and I've never played with it on the actual gun. Once you remove the outer barrel, it does expose the thread at the front of the gun just here, which allows you to attach suppressors and other flash hiders if you want to. Uh, the gun does also have a mock charging handle, which is spring-loaded but serves no purpose whatsoever because the hop-up is actually located here, in, inside the thumb hole of the here. There's a little trapdoor that you push back and there's your hop-up in there. It's a rotary dial type and it's a little bit stiff but it's very accurate and easy to make precise adjustments with and because it's stiff you know it's not going to change itself mid-game. Uh, going back to the front of the gun, it has three rails, it has a big top one just here and two little ones on either side. Now, one thing I've noticed with these side rails is that there's only one point of contact on them, so they're basically only good for single contact things like pistol attachments, that sort of thing. But also, if you have an attachment that's too wide, such as this mount I use for my contour camera, when you try and mount it on, it's going to actually clash with the front of the magazine, so you can't actually load mags into the gun if you clamp for the attachments too thick. So if you are getting attachments for this gun, make sure they're single point of contact only and that you can fit them on and take the mag in and out. Otherwise, obviously you're gonna find yourself in a bit of trouble and won't be able to use the attachments. Uh, a couple of things as well. At the front of the gun, you've got your fire selector just here. Now you can twist it from safe, semi and full auto. It's also worth noting that the trigger is a dual stage type, meaning that on fully automatic, if you pull the trigger back halfway, it'll fire off shots one at a time, pull it back all the way and it'll go to full auto. Now, I have had a problem with the semi-auto feature on this gun, however. Uh, what it tends to do is it has a bit of an identity crisis. Sometimes it'll fire semi, but sometimes it'll also spit out a burst of five or six rounds. Now, this is a bit of a deal breaker for me because I originally wanted this gun to go to indoor CQB sites. But if they're semi-auto only days and this gun starts firing burst fire, you're going to have trouble with players and marshals. In fact, the, I haven't actually been able to take this to a CQB site because I've been worried that I won't actually even be able to allow to use it because of this flaw. Now, going back over the rest of the gun, you've got the top loading mag just here. I've been using the 300 round high caps and 90% of the time I've had no trouble with them whatsoever. There are some cases where the BBs aren't feeding at the back, just give it a quick slap on the top to jiggle the rounds around and it'll get going again. Um, sometimes, however, I have had one mag that the instant you drop it in, it actually completely unwinds itself. And this is an issue because the actual winder for the mag is located underneath the magazine itself, not on top. So you can't top up the winder on this mid-game. Um, luckily, once it's working properly, it will last an entire worth of magazine on one complete wind. So if the mags are working fine, then you're going to have tr no troubles whatsoever. But as I say, just a couple of little things to be aware of that. I've heard that the mid-cap mags work exceptionally well, however, so that's just something to note. Uh, you take the mags in and out by pulling back these two tabs just here, so you push them back, lift the mag out, and then goes the new one. Once you do put the mag in, I will give it a quick double tap with the back of my palm just to make sure that it is actually clicked in place. It is very stiff, this mag release, so you just want to make sure your mag is in all the way. Um, on the subject of the mags as well, you load them by opening them up just here. There's a little slider tab that you bring all the way up to the top and then you open this trap door here and load the BBs in. It's important to know that you need to pull the slider up before you open the trap door, otherwise you're going to be loading BBs into the spring behind the mechanism that pushes them towards the feeding. So just be aware of that. Just a little thing really, but uh, you'll pick it up quite easily. It's a very simple thing to remember. Now going right to the back of the gun, you have your battery storage space just here. On the buttstock, there's a tab on the bottom that if you press inwards, it allows it to slide off and away you go. Now, the gun originally comes with Tamiya connectors. I changed mine out to Dean's. And the battery space is this bit here. It's a very chunky, rectangular shape. So finding batteries was a bit of a challenge, but I've been running it on these LiPos with no trouble whatsoever. So... In the conversion from a real steel to an airsoft gun, it's produced a very interesting compact ambidextrous design which I'm very much a fan of. However, there are one or two issues with it. Another mechanical issue I had is that on the second game I ever used this gun on, the fuse blew out. Now, if I hadn't had a spare gun, I'd have been stuffed for the rest of the day and that would have been a waste of money and time. So, a little bit annoyed with that. And also there's the fact that the semi-auto is a bit dodgy and doesn't really want to be a semi-auto. So. Two things you need to think about there, but uh, aside from that, there's a fair amount of decent features and the gun performance is pretty damn good. 
So the last time I was at Black Dagger Airsoft in Dronfield, I managed to get in a shooting test with this gun. I was lying prone 30 metres away from the target and I was using 0.25 gram BBs. So as can be seen from the shooting test, a lot of the shots actually manage to connect with the target. This means that even though the gun is actually very small and compact, it can still actually be fairly accurate at range, surprisingly so in fact. Um, one thing that you may have picked up on the shooting test though, I was using semi-auto fire the entire time, but sometime the gun was double tapping and sending bursts down range. That wasn't me, that was the gun. Um, again, this is going back to that semi-auto problem I was talking about earlier. What I think it is, is that... Um, it's not the trigger, it's the actual speed of the gun. The motor is going so quickly, the turnover is so fast that it has trouble limiting it. So that's that feature showing itself there in that shooting test. So again, something to be aware of. Also, when I was at Black Dagger, I managed to get this gun into a chronograph test. Now, before we jump into this, I did have a slight cock up on that. The chrono was set to 0.2 gram BBs and I was actually shooting two fives. So what you want to do for that is add about 30 to 40 FPS onto the actual chrono results. Also, there were times when the shots were actually hitting the inside of the chronograph and then bouncing off and so reducing the speed. So that explains the vast drop to 190 FPS shots. That's a muck up on my part. So as can be seen from the chrono test, it was shooting around about 240 what it was reading, which when you convert it back to what a 0.2 gram should have been fine, that's 270, 280, which is exactly what they've written on the side of the box before it left the Tokyo Marui factory. So fairly consistent FPS because it's a Japanese gun, it's always going to be shooting around about 280 just because they have different FPS limits over there. Um, what this means is that the shots coming out of this gun are going to be quite slow. So much so, in fact, that even at long ranges, your target can sometimes see the BBs coming and has time to duck back into cover. So even though the hop-up, which is very decent in this gun, can reach targets at long ranges, sometimes they can see the shots coming and have time to get out of the way. So where do you want to be on the airsoft field to get the absolute most out of this gun? Well, I think the answer should be a fairly obvious one. You want to be right up in people's faces with this. This is an absolute CQB machine. The very high rate of fire combined with the lightweight means that it's incredibly good in close quarters. You can just run up to target, sprint at full speed, get right up in people's grill before they actually realise that you're right next to them. Now, if you're thinking that this gun is only good for CQB, however, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. The decent hop up in this means that it can reach ranges far beyond what a gun this size should be able to achieve. So you are going to surprise targets at the mid to long ranges as well. Couple of things to note, um, when you're using this gun, especially on fully automatic, there are two things you're gonna run out of very quickly, ammo and friends. It is extremely easy to overkill people with this because of the rate of fire, and when you're hosing down another target, they're gonna get rightfully pissed off about it. It's very easy to do because of the rate of fire of this gun. So watch your trigger discipline out there, otherwise you're gonna piss off a fair few of your other players. Um, aside from that, however, and the semi-auto problems that I mentioned recently, which stops you from going to semi-auto only games, this is an extremely good gun, good for close quarters, but also surprisingly good at the mid to long range as well. So to summarise then, is the Tokyo Marui PS90 High Scythe call worth picking up? Now, this was a surprisingly tough call for me to make because the gun is an absolute riot to use, but I'm going to have to say that I can't recommend this gun. This is mainly due to the semi-auto problems that I listed earlier. If you can't take a CQB gun to CQB sites because it starts burst firing on semi-auto, it completely kills the idea of this gun stone dead. Now, if you go to sites where semi-auto only isn't an issue or you're an outdoor player, you're going to have a whale of a time with this gun. 
But if you were looking for something that is good for close quarters, semi-auto only days, I think you're a bit out of luck on this one, unfortunately. Now, I do hope that you've enjoyed this video review of the Tokumari PS90 High Cycle AEG. If you've got any questions you'd like to leave, maybe you've had your own things about this gun, your own experiences that you want to share, just leave them in the comment section down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And until next time, this has been Dale of Lone Wombat Airsoft.